I, I am very excited to be able to study with all of you today, and I'm very, very excited to welcome our speaker, an old classmate of mine, and I don't mean old in an age sense, Jeff, I mean old in the sense that we were ordained 17 years ago, as we were just discussing. Uh, Rabbi Jeff Middleman is the director, the founding director of an organization called Sinai and Synapses. Sinai and Synapses bridges the religious and scientific worlds offering people a worldview that is scientifically grounded and spiritually uplifting. They do some really interesting work around the intersection between religion and science. I'm going to put their, their website into the chat here so you can check it out. And as we're getting started, I'll just invite you, as we always do, to put your name and your location into the chat so we can get a sense of who it is that we're studying with here. And as you're doing that, I'll invite you to join me in the blessing for study. And then we'll turn things right over to Rabbi Middleman and begin our discussion. You can join me. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kidshanu V'mitzvotav V'tzivanu La'asok V'divrei Torah. Blessed is the one whose mitzvot bring holiness to our lives and who commands us to engage in, to immerse in words of Torah. So I'll turn things right over to my friend and colleague and our teacher, uh, Rabbi Jeff Middleman. Thank you, Micah. Wonderful to be with you all. Nice to see you all. You have a wonderful, wonderful teacher here with Micah. He's been a great friend and colleague for, for me. I also would say old, but not necessarily that old, although we're getting up there. I got the more gray hairs than I did 17 years ago. Um, so as Micah said, I do work on the intersection of religion and science uh, through my organization, Sinai and Synapses. And one of the things that we talk about through Sinai and Synapses is, is that the questions that we face in this world are not just religious questions and they're not just scientific questions, they're human questions. Uh, and so what I wanna look at today are questions of hope from a scientific perspective and a Jewish perspective. And one of my favorite jokes that there are, you'll hear I say a lot of my favorite, one of my favorite jokes was from uh, uh, Rabbi Joseph Telushkin who tells the story I don't know if this is still accurate in Israel or not, but there's a, a story of maybe 15, 20 years ago where somebody makes Aliyah, moves to moves to Israel and tries to get his internet set up. And it takes a week and nothing happens. And two weeks, nothing happens. And three weeks, nothing happens. And eventually he goes to where the internet company is and he says, look, I've, I've been living here and and I have not had my internet connected. And it's three weeks, I, I can't, I can't, live without internet connection. And the bureaucrat shows this gigantic stack of papers. It says, see all the stack of papers? This is the list of people who are in front of you. And the man who's totally demoralized and said, oh, does that mean that there's no hope? And the man said, it is forbidden for a Jew. There is no hope. No ch chance, maybe. And so, you know, in, in Judaism, there's such a sense of like, Hope is so integral here. There's a difference between hope and optimism, hope and a chance. We always are thinking of, of hope in different kinds of ways. And hope is kind of hard to hold on to. It's been hard to hold on to um, over the last, whether we say since October 7th in the last few years. I'm, I'm just curious by a show of hands, how many of you feel hopeful about the future of our country right now? I see one hand. <laughs> How many people are feeling, or two hands? Okay, a couple of people are feeling hopeful. How many of people feeling not as hopeful about the future of Israel or our society or these kinds of, you know, different kinds of, yeah, most people right now are saying it is very, very hard to be feeling hope right now. Um, and that's very understandable. And one of the reasons is that we tend to focus, our evolutionarily, our focus is on the negative rather than the positive. Um, because anything that happens negative, there's a bigger chance, that's a bigger downside. So if you are trying to make a decision of, am I gonna do something or not? So if I walk by and I just say, well, do I wanna jump on these berries or do I not wanna have these berries? Do I wanna take advantage of this opportunity or not? Well, if you take the berry, that's that's a good thing. But if you, if you miss it, if you miss the, you, these berries, not a huge deal, there's gonna be more berries down the road. But if you're walking down through the African savanna and you happen to see a saber-toothed tiger and you say, well, maybe I'll be okay, maybe I won't, that's a much bigger decision and a much bigger negative consequence if you, if you make the wrong choice. 
So our natural tendency, understandably, is to be focused on the negative. And I want to frame this as a, as a, as a question of the time scale, because we tend to think about what's happening right now in terms of like October 7th, or we think about um, our American democracy right now. And I, I, Mike, I apologize. I don't know enough about Canadian politics, but I, I've got to assume that sort of in general, North America, there's an angst that's happening. Or if we're thinking about Russia and Ukraine, it's very hard to hold on to hope. But I want to think about it not in the last sort of five years or 10 years or 20 years, but let's think about it in terms of a, of a long-term perspective. And I want you to think about it in, in, in this way. I'm thinking about in the last, say, like 200,000 years of human history or last 200 years of human history. If you think about it in this way, when would you like to live at any point in the last 50 years, 200 years, 1,000 years, 200,000 years? Most people would say now. Right, right now, Bob is, right? So, right, and the question becomes, well, why, why, and, and Bob, actually, I'd love it if you're, because you are very emphatic. Why, why do you say right now? That's actually, I think that's the way a lot of people would, would talk about this. Can, I, I'd love for you to jump in and share a little bit. Well, you don't really know the details about any other time, but it's highly likely that there were bad things going on back then also. Maybe it wasn't as easy to know about them without the instant gratification of social media, but it was still happening. And uh, survival for each individual was more difficult. So uh, I'll take my easy life right now, despite all the concerns and fears and negatives. That's, and that's exactly right, right? We don't we don't think about all the good things that happen. We tend to focus on all the negatives that happen because where do we find most of our information? It was at least newspaper, TV. Now it's social media, and and things that are negative tend to be more. We tend to focus more upon them. We tend to spend more time and energy on them. We don't look at the as somebody said, look at the trend lines, not the headlines. Um, I want to share actually a, 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 a really wonderful um, website called Human Progress that looks at all of these different questions of what does human progress happen? And you can see all of these different different um, ways in which we think about these questions of, of the um, gross domestic product goes way up. Global population and absolute poverty is going way down. Change of commodity prices. It, Look, nothing is nothing is perfect. It's not going to be a straight line always, but it tends to it tends to move here. Are we running out of resources? No, we're not running out of resources. The food supply is going up. Um, how many um, uh, autocracies and democracies? Look at how many autocracies there were in eighteen hundred versus democracies, and here we change the number of interstate worldwide have, have gone down over time. Um, you can see more natural disasters. All of these different, all of these different ways in which uh, um, natural disasters, the number of people who have killed, um, you know, one of the things that that I that I love, and I tell this story, and you can you can we can I can include this this website here. I'll put that in the chat. Um, when we say, for example, Unatana Tokev, and we say on, on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we talk about who shall live and who shall die, and we and we say these words. And if we think about these, these kinds of, of questions, if you've ever read the English of this, and, and we say this on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, um, on Rosh Hashanah it is written, on Yom Kippur it is sealed, who shall live and who shall die? Who by plague, who by fire, who by water, who by beast, who by strangling? And if I, I remember when I had a student pulpit now 20 years ago, I was reading this and there was the list saying it in English. And I think I'm saying, um, who, by, who, who by wild beast? And some 13-year-old sort of snarkily turned to his, his parents and said, yep, that's how I'm going to die, by wild beast. And we sort of laugh about that because in even 2003, we're not worried about getting killed by a wild beast. But in the time of Unatana Tokev, that was something that was, that was a challenge. Or we talk about who by fire. If you think about who by fire, that was a real issue. If there, if there is a fire in your community that is going to be front page news in your community, right? If, there, if, there, if some building burns down, 
That is front page news. That was not front page news 100, 200, 500 years ago. Why? The ways in which we've created fire safety and smoke alarms and, and fireproof um, building materials. These are not questions of, of where we're worried that much about fire right now. Um, all of these different ways in which we have actually built all of these structures that have made our life better that we don't even think about here. Um, Carol, you've got your hand up. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Oh, you're muted. Yep. I was just writing it in since my hand wasn't recognized. You didn't have one very major thing on your charts. Yeah. And that's the effect of the the environmental issues and the fact that we are basically destroying the earth. And, so so and climate change and land loss and loss of species and loss of arable land and it goes on and on and on and it's getting worse and worse and worse so so i i think there there's there's there are elements of that word which are absolutely true and that is something and this is the thing of of asking of what is the purpose of hope and and one of the things that is challenging with with climate change, and there's some really interesting research about this, which is climate change and the way in which climate change is often framed is creating an existential dread and despair, which doesn't necessarily inspire action. All of these charts that I shared, these are all things in which we as human beings decided that we were going to make better um, individually and societally right now. And so, it doesn't mean that the world is perfect, but it does mean, are there ways in which we can address these kinds of challenges, right? We, we realized that, wow, fire was a big problem. Drowning was a big problem. Um, the, you know, the, the, the amount of vaccine uptick in, in of all these different um, vaccines, they all have, have gone up in, in these kinds of ways. So the question becomes, how do we frame the climate, the climate crisis, not as something that is, um, unsolvable, but how do we find moments of hope to be able to act in this kind of way? Um, I think that's where a lot of the, that's where a lot of the challenges and, and, and um, framing it as we can't do anything, that's where the, that's where actually the biggest problem is going to be. So, so hope is, is not necessarily a feeling. Hope is something that is, um, that is an active element, right? It's the difference of, of, I don't know where people's politics are, but it's the difference of Trump four years ago saying COVID will go away like a miracle versus people actually trying to create the vaccine and 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 getting people to be able to take it, right? Like that's, there, there's there's a difference of uh, of hope versus optimism. Um, but on that, on that site, there are actually a, a variety of different ways in which, um, a lot of the environmental work has actually gotten a little bit better. Now it's not where it was a couple hundred years ago, but it, but it is getting a little bit better of where it was in the last five to 10. Uh, so thank you, I, I, that's, a, that's a very, very valid point. Um, Anne. I just wanted to mention that what nailed hope down for me was several years ago, I was given the assignment to speak about the Holocaust so that we could raise money for the memorial scrolls we have. And I started reading the memoirs of people like Anne Frank and Heschel and Rabbi Shapira, the um, ghetto rabbi, and there's hope. I mean, mm -hmm. if these people could have that degree of belief and hope, who am I? I made me feel ashamed. And that's what renewed for me everything. Mm -hmm. And and hope. I mean, this is this is one of the things that is both both wonderful and challenging about hope. Um, and that and that because hope, I will also say there there can be a little bit of a of a dark side of hope. Um, I I I had a uh, I was doing chaplaincy work, and I know Micah, you also had to do uh, a clinical pastoral education. And if you've ever been in a, in a situation with with a with a, 
a, a patient, whether that's you or a family member, I was working with a with a, a parent who there was a five year old who had um, I think encephalitis, and the doctors had said there was there was not a, there was not a good diagnosis, and and the parent actually kind of ignored the diagnosis and said um, said God will never let his children go. He happened to be Catholic, and and it became a hard place for me because there's always a there's always a balance of what's reasonable hope, what's unreasonable hope. Because sometimes if you hold on to hope for too long, that can actually be a little bit destructive. Um, you know, we there, there's actually there's a there's a a book, and I'll I'll include this here as well, maybe in the in the show notes or in the Zoom. That um, that. I'll actually, you know what? I'll, I'll share. I'll share a text. Actually, I'll share a little text to be able to to, to talk about this. Um, that there's an idea in Judaism called the Yetzer Hara that we that we may have heard of. Uh, Yetzer Hara is often described as the evil inclination. Sometimes it's viewed as a as a selfish inclination. It's usually deals with greed or or sex or things along those lines. And, the, and, and in Midrash Rabbah, in, in rabbinic texts, there's a, there's a quote from Rabbi Nachman, who said, after the, after the creation of the world, um, behold, it was good, refers to the good desire. The good desire is all the tzedakah and wonderful and happy things that we love and we try to be a good person. Um, and behold, it was very good, refers to the evil desire, the yetzer hara. And, and the rabbis say, can the evil desire be very good? How can, how can the Yetzer Hara, its translation is literally the evil desire. How can that be good? And they say, without the evil desire, no one would build a house or get married or beget children. And thus said Solomon again, I considered all the labor and all the excelling in work that is a man's rivalry with his neighbor. There is value in hope like if you if you are partnered if you got if you got you know partnered with somebody or if you had children there is an element of hope you don't know what's going to happen you know mike and i were both starting like this is starting la asok there is hope that is in here right there is there is a, there is that, that without hope that this is going to be a sustainable business model it would never start it in this kind of way um and so and 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 any kind of business there without an idea of I am I am going to move forward, nothing would be created. And at the same time, 20% of businesses fail in the first year, 60% of businesses fail in the first five. So so the question becomes, well, when do you hold on? When, when do you when is it value when is it valuable and when is it destructive to hold on to hope here? Um, yeah, Carol. Me again. Yeah. I have never understood that passage. I have never yeah. understood why the evil inclination was the spur to all of these things that they say about you'd never have children, you'd never do this. You, ne I have never understood what, I have never understood it. Can you elaborate? Sure. So, so there are a lot of different things that, can be both constructive and destructive. Um, the way in which our family and our gene line um, continues is is through is through sexual reproduction. Um, and sexual reproduction, though, can be very, very destructive. There's there are all sorts of different. You know, you know if you think about all of the um, all of the ethical issues that have been coming up over the last however many years, they tend to be about either sex or money or power. Right? That's it. most most of those issues deal with with an abuse of those different ideas, and yet sex is crucial to to who we are. Partnering with somebody that's that is that fills us up emotionally. Power can be enormously valuable because power is how we influence the world. Um, and so the Yetzer Hara is the is the impetus, and it's not something that necessarily is is evil, but it's something that needs to be directed here. Um, and so uh, so it's a little bit, you know, if we, we can think about it in terms of, of Christian ideas of, of people who are people who are saints, um, they they sort of live in an ethereal way and, and nothing really gets gets generated here. But the but the Yetzer Hara 
is an, is an impetus that drives us to be able to move forward. Um, I see a few that hands. Made sense. What? That made sense for the first time. Oh, good. I'm glad. Um, I, I want to get Bob and then, and then Mike and then Lauren. So thank you. The only word I want to add is desire. The mm -hmm. evil influence is desire. Yep. And, and by the way, hope, almost by definition, is something that is desired. When you are hoping, you are looking to have something happen here. Um, and again, hope is hope is not an unadulterated good, right? But but hope is is it, 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 there's a there's a book, and I I can't even remember if I mentioned it or not. Annie Duke, who's a she was actually a professional poker player. She wrote a book called Quit um, of of why it's valuable at times to quit and and when to know when to quit because sometimes how often have we been in a toxic relationship, whether that's in a romantic relationship or business relationship. Because sometimes quitting, saying no to something allows you to say yes to something else and, and, and being able to identify what is that desire here. Um, Micah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick thought. The the passage you shared about the Yitzhahara reminds me of Maimonides, actually, who talks about the, the I mean, it's, it's Aristotle as well, the, the, the golden mean, the middle, the middle road, where he suggests that if you're, if you're too, for example, if you're always selfish, then you'll never share. That's bad. But if you're never selfish, then you'll never have anything for yourself. You'll give everything away so that any character trait can be taken to an extreme. And I was thinking in terms of the conflict, which, of course, the conflict is the reason that we originally created this program and, you know, that we need so much hope and the world feels dark. And there's the, there's political conflict going on in Israel, Palestine right now, in you know the politics of the various cultures that we're living in, and I was thinking that our capacity to feel connected to groups has this very strong positive for us. We feel connected with fellow Jews. We feel connected with fellow, you know, whatever Democrats or fellow members of the conservative party or whatever. But then that has a dark side as well, where we then feel disconnected from people who are different from us. So it seems to me that that capacity for sort of building in connection with each other is one of those qualities, one of those elements that I think leads to great good in our lives and also to great destruction in our lives. There's there's a thinker, I highly recommend a book by Jonathan Haidt called The, the, Righteous, the Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. And his line is that morality binds and blinds. We um, we have an, a, a, a natural tendency to connect with a community. And, and there is a way in which we say, this is my community and this is not my community. There are people right there, or because as, as I think a lot of people said this, but I'm going to quote Charles Schultz, who, um, who was the creator of Peanuts, who said, I love humanity. It's people I can't stand. Um, it's a lot of people who are able to say, I love humanity. I want to have this wonderful idea. But until you're actually able to interact with the people in front of you, that's where that comes in. And, and one, of the, one of the other important things that is valuable for human knowledge and human flourishing is that we have multiple different identities. And we can put that, that identity hat on in different kinds of ways. So we are not only Jews. We are not only members of a particular party. We are not only people in a geographic area. We are those things, but we also can can shift. Um, so yeah, Lauren. Um, I think that, well, certainly for me, the Yitzhar Hara in reading what I what I read uh, in, the, in the Bible is, it instills perceptions of fear just by what it, what it talks about. You're not you're not necessarily participating in it, but you're warned, and it's a it's a negative reinforcement of what not to do. I I think that hope, I I don't just I don't define hope necessarily as making me feel better. Right. I I I define it as is opening up an awareness um, so that I can look at what the contrast is, and once you can define that then you can make your way through 
a number of things that are very disturbing. It's very disturbing to, to discuss and hear about all the things we've talked about this morning in our contemporary society. The hope comes in is being able to look at it and not be influenced by the reality that it doesn't have an a, a, a contrast. There, there needs to be a contrast and that's where the work comes in. Right. Me. Right. And that's, and, and, and that's, and, th and there's a difference between hope and optimism. Um, and there's a difference between optimism and Pollyanna-ish. Um, and so th that hope, hope is something that is, that is active. Um, so thank you. Um, Karen, and then I want to say, I know we have only a couple of minutes left, so I want to say a few, a few last words. Yeah. I guess one of the, one of the biggest challenges uh, for me is the sort of dichotomy between knowing that there are all of these objective um, measures that show us how the world is a better place. You know, for example, X million people a year are able to rise out of poverty. Um, the, the problem, the conflict that I guess that we probably, so many of us struggle with is that is cold comfort to the person who doesn't know where their next meal is coming from. Right. So I guess, you know, it, it, it's easy for, for us living, a, you know, a, a basically, you know, a, a white middle class Western comfortable life um, to say, isn't that wonderful? Um, but I guess that's where um, turning hope into action and our responsibility comes in to, you know, to, I guess, to lessen, lessen those gaps. That, so that, that's a, a wonderful way I want to end here because I think that, that's, that's a, a, a great point. And that is a challenge. And I think one of the things that, that comes up is there's a difference between utopia and protopia. Utopia is a wonderful, perfect area where every, everyone lives in harmony. It's gone Eden, it's the Garden of Eden, and that's, that's unachievable. And actually trying to create a utopia ultimately be, becomes very destructive, right? Because, because that you're not viewing the individuals here. Protopia is things are not necessarily good, but they're getting better. There's a trajectory of getting better. And that's one of the things that 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 we can we can try to measure. It is it is hard because we the people who are struggling with where am I going to find my next meal, you know, particularly thinking about what's happening in, in Israel and Gaza. And you know, that's that is very much on our on the forefront of our minds and something we need to think about here and now. Um, and yet at the same time. Stephen, a lot of the quotes come from from uh, Stephen Pinker, who's a writer book called Enlightenment Now. That um, that that one of the things that that he that he often talks about is that it's it is it, it's an idea of we're never going to be perfect, but it's going to be getting it's going to be getting better. But, you know, follow, again, follow follow the trend lines and not and not the headlines. And so as we're we're thinking about the, these are all these ways in which the society makes a decision to be able to make to to improve the world a little bit better. The question that Pinker says we always talk is why is there war? Why is there war? That's not the right question. The right question is why is there peace? Why is there health? That's it, it, there are many more ways things can go wrong than it can be to go right. And as we saw this on October seventh, it's 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 very easy to be able to break things. It's much harder to be able to, to build things up. And that's where the role of hope comes in. Um, and so that's that's at least my takeaway, which is that it is, it is, it is about the individuals, but it's also about what do we do as a society to be able to enhance individuals. And that's and it's it it is never going to be perfect. The trend line is never going to be a straight line, but but we also have to celebrate. Things are better overall. Things are better now than they were, and if they are not, we can change that. And so that's that's at least that's my takeaway. That's at least my my hope here for for this for this time together. So, um, Mike, I don't know if you have any last thoughts. Um, I'll just say thank you to Rabbi Jeff Middleman for a, a really interesting discussion. Um, I'll just say I, I feel like these discussions just keep getting better and better. And I'm grateful to all of you for um, coming out each week. Next week, I'll be teaching. And then I just want to lift up two weeks from now, we have Rabbi Josh Weinberg, who is um, Vice President of the Union for Reform Judaism for Israel and Reform Zionism. And that should be a really 
uh, interesting and worthwhile discussion as well. So I look forward to seeing you over the next um, few weeks as well. And once again, thanks to Rabbi Jeff Middleman and to everyone for being here. Thank you for taking some time with us this, this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.